East of my home, the long ridge lies across the skyline like a low hull of a submarine. Above it, the eastern sky is bright with reflections of distant water, and there is a feeling of sails beyond land. Hill trees mass together in a dark spied forest, but when I move towards them they slowly fan apart. The sky descends between them and they are solitary oaks and elms, each with its own wide territory of winter shadow. The calmness, the solitude of horizons lures me towards them, through them, and onto others. They layer the memory like strata. From the town, the river flows northeast, bends east round the north side of the ridge, turns south through the estuary. The upper valley is a flat, open plain. Lower down it is a narrow and steep-sided. Near the estuary, it is again flat and open. The plain is like an estuary of land, scattered with iron island farms. The plain is like an estuary of land, scattered with island farms. The river flows slowly, meanders. It is too small for the long, wide estuary, which is once a mouth of a much larger river that drained most of Middle England. Detailed descriptions of landscape are tedious. One part of England is superficially so much like another. The differences are subtle, coloured by love. The soil here is clay, boulder clay to the north of the river, London clay to the south. There is gravel on the river terraces, on the higher ground of the ridge. Once forest, then pasture, the land is now mainly arable. Woods are small with few large trees, chiefly oak standards with hornbeam or hazel coppice. Many hedges have been cut down. Those that still stand are hawthorn, blackthorn, and elm. Elms grow tall in their clay. Their varying shapes contour the winter sky. Cricket bat willows mark the river courses. Alders line the brook. Hawthorn grows well. It's a country of elm and oak and thorn. People native to the clay are surly and slow to burn, morose and smouldering as alderwood, laconic, heavy as the land itself. There are 400 miles of tidal coast, if all the creeks and islands are included. It is the longest and most irregular county coastline. It is the driest county, yet watery edged flacking down to the marsh and salting and mud flat. The drying, sandy mud of the ebb tide makes the sky clear above. Clouds reflect water and shine it back inland. Farms are well ordered, prosperous, but a fragrance of neglect still lingers like the ghost of a fallen grass. There is always a sense of loss, a feeling of being forgotten. There is nothing else here, no castles, no ancient monuments, no hills like green clouds. It is just a curve of the earth, a rawness of winter fields. Dim, flat, desolate lands that cauterize all sorrow. I've always longed to be a part of the outward life, to be out there at the edge of things, to let a human taint wash away in emptiness and silence as the fox sloughs his smell into the cold unworldliness of water. To return to the town as a stranger. One wandering. Wandering flushes a glory that fades with arrival. I came to the late I came late to the love of birds. For years I saw them only as a tremor at the edge of vision. They know suffering and joy in simple states not possible for us. Their lives quicken and warm to a pulse our hearts can never reach. They race to oblivion. They are old before we have finished growing. The first bird I searched for was the nightjar, which used to nest in the valley. The first bird I searched for was a nightjar which used to nest in the valley. Its song is like the sound of a stream of wine spilling from a height into deep and booming gask. Its song is like the sound of a stream and wine spilling from the height into a deep and booming cask. It is an odorous sound with a bouquet that rises to the quiet sky. In the glare of day it would seem thinner and drier, but dusk mellows it and gives it vintage. If a song could smell, this song would smell of crushed grapes and almonds and dark woods. The sound spills out and none of it is lost. The wood, the whole wood brims with it. Then it stops, suddenly, unexpectedly, but the ear hears it still, a prolonged and fading echo draining and winding out among the surrounding trees. 
Into the deep stillness between the early stars and the long afterglow, the nightjar leaps up joyfully. It glides and flutters, dances and bounces lightly, silently away. In pictures, it seems to have a frog-like despondency, a mournful aura, as though it were a sepulchred in twilight. In pictures, it seems to have a frog-like despondency, a mournful aura, as though it were sepulchred in twilight, ghostly and disturbing. It is never like that in life. Through the dusk, one sees only its shape and its flight, intangibly light and gay, graceful and nimble as a swallow. Sparrowhawks were always near me in the dusk, like something I meant to say but could never quite remember. Their narrow heads glared blindly through my sleep. I pursued them for many summers, but they were hard to find and harder to see, being so few and so wary. They lived a fugitive, gorilla life, in all of the overgrown, neglected places, the frail bones of generations of sparrowhawks are sifting down now into the deep humus of the woods. They were a banished race of beautiful barbarians, and when they died, they could never be replaced. I have turned away from the musky opulence of the summer woods, where so many birds are dying. Autumn begins my season of hawk hunting. Spring ends it. Winter glitters between like the Ark of Orion. I saw my first peregrine on a December day at the estuary ten years ago. The sun reddened out of the right. The sun reddened out of the white river mist. Fields glittered with rime. Boats were encrusted with it. Only the gently lapping water moved freely and shone. I went along the high river wall towards the sea. The stiff, crackling white grass became limp and wet as the sun rose through a clear sky into dazzling mist. Frost stayed all day in shaded places, and the sun was warm, there was no wind. I rested at the foot of the wall and watched Dunlin feeding at the tide line. Suddenly, they threw Suddenly they flew upstream, and hundreds of finches fluttered overhead, whirling away with a rrrr of desperate wings. Too slowly it came to me that something was happening which I ought not to miss. I scrambled up and saw that the stunted hawthorns on the inland slope of the wall were full of field fares. Their sharp bills pointed to the northeast, and they clacked and spluttered in alarm. I followed their point and saw a falcon flying towards me. It veered to the right and passed inland. It was like a kestrel, but bigger and yellower, with a more bullet-shaped head, longer wings, and greater zest and buoyancy of flight. It did not glide till it saw starlings feeding in the stubble, then it swept down and was hidden among them as they rose. A minute later, it rushed overhead and was gone in a breath into the sunlit mist. It was flying much higher than before, flinging and darting forwards, with its sharp wings angled back and flicking like a snipe's. This was my first peregrine. I have seen many since then, but none has excelled it for speed and fire of spirit. For ten years I spent all of my winter searching for that restless brilliance, for the sudden passion and violence that peregrines flush from the sky. For ten years I have been looking upward for that cloud-biting anchor shape, that crossbow flinging through the air. The eye becomes insatiable for hawks. It clicks towards them with ecstatic fury. It clicks towards them with ecstatic fury. Just as the hawk's eye swings and dilates the luring feud shapes of gull and pigeons. To be recognized and accepted by a peregrine, you must wear the same clothes, travel the same way, perform actions in the same order. Like all birds, it fears the unpredictable. Enter and lead at the same fields at the same time each day. Soothe the hawk from. Enter and leave the same fields at the same time each day. Soothe the hawk from its wilderness by a ritual of behaviour as invariable as its own. Hood the glare of the eyes. Hide the white tremor of the hands. Shade the stark, reflecting face. Assume the stillness of a tree. A peregrine fears nothing he can clearly see in far off. Approach him across open ground with a steady, unfaltering movement. Let your shape grow in size, but do not alter its outline. 
Never hide yourself unless concealment is complete. Be alone. Shun the furtive oddity of man. Cringe from the hostile eyes of farms. Learn to fear. To share fear is the greatest bond of all. The hunter must become the thing he hunts. What is, is now, must have been the quivering intensity of an arrow thudding into a tree. Yesterday is dim, a monochrome. A week ago, you were not born. Persist, endure, follow, watch. Hawk hunting sharpens vision. Pouring away behind the moving bird, the land flows out from the eye in deltas of piercing colour. The angled eye strikes through the surface dross as the oblique axe cuts into the heart of the tree. A vivid sense of place grows like another limb. Direction has colour and meaning. South is a bright, blocked place, opaque and stifling. West is a thickening of the earth into trees, a drawing together, the great beef side of England, the heavenly haunch. North is open, bleak, away to nothing. East is a quickening in the sky, a beckoning of light, a storming suddenness of sea. Time is measured, time is measured by a clock of blood. When one is active, close to the hawk, pursuing, the pulse races, time goes faster. When one is still, waiting, the pulse quietens, time is slow. Always, as one hunts for the hawk, one has an oppressive sense of time contracting inwards like a tightening spring. One hates the movement of the sun, the steady alteration of the light, the increase of hunger, the maddening metronome of the heartbeat. When one says 10 o'clock or 3 o'clock, this is not the grey and shrunken time of towns. It is the memory of a certain fulmination or declension of light that was unique to that time and that place on that day. A memory as vivid to the hunter as burning magnesium. As soon as the hawk hunter steps from his door, he knows the way of the wind. He feels the weight of the air. Far within himself, he seems to the hawk's day growing Far within himself, he seems to see the hawks day growing steadily towards the light of their first encounter. Time and weather hold both hawk and watcher between their turning poles. When the, hawk when the hawk is found, the hunter can look lovingly back at all tedium and misery of searching and waiting that went on before. All is transfigured, as though the broken columns of ruined temple had suddenly resumed their ancient splendour. I shall try to make plain the bloodiness of killing. Too often this has been slurred over by those who defend hawks. Flesh-eating man is in no way superior. It is so easy to love the dead. The word predator is baggy with misuse. All birds eat living flesh at some time in their lives. Consider the cold-eyed thrush, that springy carnivore of lawns, worm stabber, basher to death of nails. We should not sentimentalize. We should not sentimentalize his song and forget the killing that sustains it. In my diary of a single winter, I have tried to preserve a unity, binding together the bird, the watcher, and the place that holds them both. In my single diary of winter, I have tried to preserve a unity, binding together the bird, the watcher, and the place that holds them both. Everything I described took place while I was watching it, but I do not believe that honest observation is enough. The emotions and behaviour of the watcher are also facts, and they must be truthfully recorded. The hardest thing of all to see is what is really there. Books about birds show pictures of the peregrine, and the text is full of information. Large and isolated in the gleaming whiteness of the page, the hawk stares back at you. Bold. Statuesque brightly coloured. But when you have shut the book, you will never see that bird again. Compared with the close and static image, the reality will seem dull and disappointing. The living bird will never be so large, so shiny bright. The living bird will never be so large, so shiny bright. It will be deep in landscape. It will be deep in landscape and always thinking farther back 
always at the point of being lost. Pictures are waxworks behind. Pictures are waxworks beside the passionate mobility of the living bird. October 28th. Beyond the last farm buildings, the smell of salt and the mud and the seaweed mingles with the smell of dead leaves and nutty autumn hedges. And suddenly there is no more inland, and green fields float after the skyline on a mist of water. At midday, I saw a fox far out of the saltings, leaping and splashing through the incoming tide. On dry ground, he walked. His fur was sleek and dark with wetness his brush limp and dripping. He shook himself like a dog, sniffed the air, and trotted towards the sea wall. Suddenly, he stopped. Looking through binoculars, I saw the small pupils of his eyes contract and dilate in their white-flecked yellowed irises. Eyes savagely alive, light smouldering within, yet glitteringly opaque as jewels. Their unchanging glare was fixed upon me as the fox walked slowly forward. When he stopped again, he was only 10 yards away, and I lowered the binoculars. He stood there for more than a minute, trying to understand me with his nose and ears, watching me with his baffled, barbaric eyes. Then the breeze conveyed my fetid, human smell, and the beautiful roan-coloured savage became a hunted fox again, ducking and darting away, streaming over the sea wall and across the long fields beyond. Widgeon and teal floated in with the tide. Waders crowded the tuft of saltings. Widgeon and teal floated. Yeah. Widgeon and teal floated in with the tide. Waders crowded the tufts of saltings. A warning puff of sparrows was followed by the peregrine, gliding slowly out of a thousand crouching waders. The elbow-like carpal joints of his wings were curved and enfolded like the hood of a cobra, and were just as menacing. He flew easily, beating and gliding round the bay, casting his shadow on the still and silent birds. Then he turned inland and flickered low and flashed. Then he turned inland and flickered low and fast across the fields. Four short-eared owls soothed out of the gorse, hushing the air with the tiptoe touch of their soft and elegant wings. Slowly they sank and rose in the wind, drifting against the white estuary and the deep green of the grass. Their big heads turned to watch me, and their fierce eyes glowed and dimmed and glowed again, as though a yellow flame burned beyond the iris and spat out flakes of fire. It then diminished. One bird called, a sharp barking sound, muffled like a heron calling in its sleep. The peregrine circled and stooped at the drifting owls, but it was like trying to hit blowing feathers with a dart. The owls swayed and turned, rocked about in the drought of the stoops, and rose higher. When they were over the water, the peregrine gave up and planned down to rest on a post near the wall. I think he could have killed one of them by cutting up at it from below, if he could have separated it from the others, but his stoops went hopelessly wide. At four o'clock he flew slowly inland, darkening briefly along the edges of sunlit fields, deepening out into the shadow of trees. I left the cold bird calming I left the cold, bird-calling calm of the ebb tide, and went into the brighter inland dusk, where the air was still heavy and warm between hedges. Woods smelt pungent and aromatic. In the pure amber of the evening, light and the dreary green of summer burned up in red and gold. Woods smelt pungent and aromatic. In the pure amber of the evening, light in the pure amber of the evening light, the dreary green of summer burned up in red and gold. They came to sunset's windless calm. The wet fields exhaled that indefinable autumnal smell. A sour, rich, sweet aroma of cheese and beer, nostalgic, pervasive in the heavy air. I heard a dead leaf loosen and drift down to touch the shining surface of the lane with a light, hard sound. The peregrine drifted slowly from a dead tree, 
like the dim brown ghost of an owl. He was waiting in the dusk, not roosting, but watching for prey. The partridge conveys the partridge coveys called and gathered in the furrows. Mallard swished down to the stubble to feed. The hawk did not move. I could see his dark shape huddled at the top of an elm, outlined against the afterglow. Below him was the shine of a stream. Snipe called. The hawk roused and crouched forward. Down from the wood on the hill, the first woodcock came slanting and weaving. Three more followed. As they dropped to the mud at the side of the stream, the hawk crashed among them. There was a sharp hissing sound and thrumming of wings as hawk and snipe and woodcock raced upwards together. They splayed out above the trees and a woodcock fell and splashed into the shallows of the stream. I saw his falling bundle shape and long bill turning aimlessly. The hawk stood in water, plucked his prey and fed. Good afternoon. I'd like to start with a small excerpt of the film um, Patience and um, continue after that. Um, sorry. Now, as I write and think once more about history, which is but a long account of calamities, it occurs to me that at one time the only acceptable expression of profound grief for ladies of the upper classes was to wear heavy robes of black silk taffeta or black crepe de chine. And Sir Thomas Brown, who was the son of a silk merchant and may well have had an eye for these things, remarks in a passage of the Pseudodoxia Epidemica that I can no longer find, that in the Holland of his time, it was customary in a home where there'd been a death to drape black mourning ribbons over all the mirrors and all canvases depicting landscapes or people or the fruits of the field, so that the soul, as it left the body, would not be distracted on its final journey either by a reflection of itself or by a last glimpse of the land now being lost. When I was invited to spend time in Essex, I couldn't help but um, imagine the landscape of Norfolk and Suffolk. Since it was the geographically closest memory I could summon, apart from London, only later did I become aware that I have never been to Norfolk or Suffolk, but imagined Sebald's, Vigi Sebald's descriptions in the rings of Saturn. And so I started this report lecture of my findings in Essex with a passage of the rings of Saturn, as I encountered it in a film about the author. I chose an excerpt that does not describe the actual landscape Sebald wandered through because I realized that my own position ra rather resembles that of the dead man's fleeting soul than that of Sebald himself, a position from which looking at or reading representations of landscape becomes indistinguishable from an actual experience or even worse for the soul at least the representations cast a stronger spell and evoke the longing to stay more than the actual landscape outside the window, which this soul has to tra traverse on its last journey. But what about the satellite views? The satellite views in the mentioned film, Patience, are from an artist called Barbara Huy and she called her work a map of the mind's adventures. She came up with the idea, idea to plot um, locations that appear in books on a digital map so that we can zoom in and zoom out like we just saw and um, make connections to the places mentioned at those locations so that um, like in Sebald's book, on the surface, it's a walk in Suffolk, 
but associated with it is a whole encyclopedia of things and places spiraling out of the book. Later I thought of Simon Faithful's video, 30 kilometers, and I want to show you a very short, short bit of that video. Simon uh, Faithful attached a camera to a weather balloon and like we saw in the video, let it go into the sky, let it fly to the sky. It goes up and up until the earth below turns into a map and then the camera finally um, leaves the atmosphere of the earth and disappears um, in the universe. <laughs> in the last images we see a few from above the clouds the curve of the earth, and then only static, nothing. I was um, asking myself why I'm so extremely touched by this video and thought that it might have to do with um, the extrapolation that's, um, for my feeling, taking place in it. We first identify with the human face, um, look Simon Faithful in, in the eye, um, to then be, or at least I have the feeling that I'm ripped out of myself and pulled out of the earth into a place where I actually shouldn't be, into the sky. An image from a time when the eye was still the human eye and not the eye of a satellite. It's um, a work by Audion Redon from the year 1878. Then later I got to know J.A. Baker's The Peregrine and my ideas of Suffolk and Norfolk were replaced by mental images of Essex. We just heard a bit of The Peregrine. I hope you could imagine the landscape as vividly as I could when I first read the book. I went to um, the archive of J.A. Baker at the University of Essex and found the beautiful manuscript of this book. The hardest thing of all is to see what is really there. Baker doesn't seem to mind where the images in his collection come from, because in, his, in, in the archive, in his collections, things that he's left behind, there were random postcards that he collected, whereas there were no photographs at all of the landscapes that he described. I was fascinated by Baker's maps and want to give you a different view from above now, the old-fashioned map as opposed to the satellite image we are used to from Google View. Baker marked on his maps of Essex the places where he spotted birds and used abbreviations for the different species, species that he encountered. On my wanderings through Essex, I came closer and closer, like you see here, approaching the River Blackwater moving towards the west of Blackwater and finally reaching Woodham Water which looks rather banal <laughs> like you see here 
but with what lies beneath is a whole world and history of um, communities. I spent quite some time in um, the Forum Library in South End and um, found books of uh, air history books on Essex and um, amongst them um, books with aerial photographs of Essex, aerial photographs showing crop marks. And I don't know if you are all familiar with um, what a crop mark actually is, so I'm going to say a few words about what it is that we see here, for example. Mm, the air was, um, the, the Great Britain was first systematically registered from above um, during the Second World War by the RAF, and archaeologists later discovered that um, those aerial photographs are actually really helpful if they want to um, find archaeological sites. And that is because at certain times of the year, um, mostly in early summer when the crop is um, becoming ripe, um, the foundations of ancient uh, monuments um, are transferred to the surface of fields and meadows. Um, there are two different kinds of crop marks. If there's a ditch underneath um, the surface, then water will be contained in it, and the crop will take longer to ripen. It will stay green longer. So you'll see green lines on an already yellowish ochre field. Whereas if there are foundations underneath the ground, stone walls, then um, the roots of those crops um, won't be able to um, take enough water in and they will dry up faster than the surrounding plants so that um, you'll have yellowish, brownish outlines, yellowish, brownish lines on a green meadow, for example. It's a kind of archaeology that can only be done from the air. I think it's remarkable that um, those kind of images um, can never be seen as um, uh, from the ground, can never be seen from, a perspective, from the perspective that we know, a perspective that um, is directed towards uh, the horizon and um, well, makes us look at things in a vertical position. <laughs> I um, tried to find as many of those, for me, fascinating aerial views as possible, and found lots and lots using a, a pocket scanner that um, Ben gave me <laughs> for my f to record my findings, to scan my findings. And because I was so clumsy with a pocket scanner in the beginning that I had never used before, there were all kinds of distortions on the scans, on the results. I wasn't able to move it smoothly above the surfaces. But then I became quite fascinated by those distortions and um, even tried to en enhance them in a way that to me seemed appropriate to the content of the images. I held up the books against the window screens of the focal point gallery and scanned through the pages so that um, the crop marks that you see on the reverse side of the respective page shine through and blur into each other. I was under the impression that that's actually what the crop marks themselves already do in landscape. They um, condense different layers of history, different um, people even, since it's been um, not only Romans and Saxons, but also um, Neolithic and even Mesolithic people that we hardly know anything about, which inhabited, um, who inhabited um, Essex. Another example of how one can actually reverse the crop mark and look from underneath, if you picture the page being flipped over and the signs on the page shining through on the turn page. 
But the crop mark photography, aerial photography, is not only concerned with ancient history, it's also concerned with recent history. Um, here we, for example, see an airfield from World War II having been turned into a golf course, or the remains of um, bunkers. And finally, I accidentally found Baker's Tower. At one point in the Peregrine, Baker describes how he um, is climbing up um, the only elevated point in the landscape that he wanders through, a tower that has since been felled, but that I discovered on one of um, the aerial photographs of the Forum Library accidentally there's actually a, there's a bird shining through from the other side. <laughs> it was really not planned <laughs> to have this bird here. I was then starting to combine my scans, the images I took into um, a video which turned out to be rather long, a long journey through Essex and an imaginary map because I um, ordered the images on rather formal grounds and not as you would have to if you would follow the geography of Essex. I visited um, a lot of the places I saw mentioned in the books that I um, looked through. And also I was aware that I would hardly see anything. I um, enjoyed the treasure hunting trips <laughs> and recorded my own footsteps in the landscapes, in the fields. I combined um, the sound recordings with the images I manipulated to sort of ground them again and to give the eye in the sky, be it the eye of an airplane pilot or a satellite view, a satellite view to give um, the disembodied eye um, a grounding, some physicality moving through an actual landscape. But back to Baker for a moment. When I found this photograph of him, I wondered if it might be his glasses that make it hard for him to see what is really there. But then I took a closer look and noticed how he is actually growing out of the meadow. It looks like he, he himself um, has either sunken into um, the earth or just grew out of it. And I had to think of um, um, Vladimir Nabokov's novel, Transparent Things, where he talks about how when you concentrate on a material object, the very act of attention may lead to, your, to our involuntary sinking into its surface. He also talks about the dream life of debris, which um, might be a good summary of what those crop marks are to me. Speaking of sunken places, I wanted to show you this image. It was taken with a 360-degree camera, so it shows um, both sides. 
of um, hedge maze I found in Saffron Walden on one of my trips through Essex. And the sunken place from which Baker maybe observed the birds, Baker observed the sky, seems to be connected with um, the grooves of that maze, the grooves of the hedge, uh, the grooves of the turf maze. And then I wanted to show you um, this image. And I'd be um, really thankful if um, I could learn more about it. It's the most mysterious page from the Beecrafts, the most um, mysterious object of, um, I found in the um, Beecraft Gallery's collection. It was accompanied by a French text describing um, the landscape of um, the South End estuary, Essex estuary um, areas. And um, I decided not to show it on Saturday, not to ask if I might borrow it from the collection because I um, just could not find out anything about it. Nobody seemed to know anything about it. And I thought, well, that's not, that's not enough. <laughs> just now, <laughs> just now, um, that I put together um, this talk and looked at um, Baker's blind glasses and looked again at um, what the 360-degree de camera produces. And now that I looked at the quote of Nabokov talking about the sunken places, talking about sinking into the surface of the earth, engraving yourself into the, on, into the surface of the earth. I thought that um, it's actually all in that image, even if I, don't, if I do not find or do not, do not know or do not find out um, what it is. It's um, sunken places, ditches, that might eventually lead to crop marks. It's a connection to the sky, be it a tunnel or be it some telepathic connection and it's the Essex landscape I suppose at least the rest of the text was about Essex and maybe those two wells, ponds are in the end eyes that look at us at, as a few fewer during my stay here I also became familiar with um, what a Claude mirror is, which I hadn't known before. Um, it goes back to Claude Laurent, a French landscape painter who used um, a blackened glass screen to find the picturesque in landscape. So I actually chose the reflection of landscape over the real landscape that he would see if only he would turn around and look the other way. He also preferred the blackened view over the bright daylight that shines on the actual landscape. Here we see an example for one of those Laurent mirrors viewfinders and another one and this is a bit hard to recognize it's from so, sorry the resolution is too bad but it's um it's just an iphone which is of course a local mirror a cloth glass in itself and maybe the um, Claude glass was actually um, using Claude glasses was actually uh, were actually produced the first selfies because what um, the Claude glass does is it always reflects you in landscape, not only what you see but you yourself in it. And this is my favorite creek. 
close to Rochester at Purdy's industrial estate. It's just a bit of wasteland and a small path that nobody ever seems to use. And I was quite happy to find something on such a small scale in such a vast country as Essex, because Essex overwhelmed me quite a bit. And I had to find niches that um, felt right for somebody who is just a visitor, somebody, something that I can make, make a place of within half an hour instead of spending years in Essex. <laughs> to discover all I wanted to discover. Another discovery, Alfred Munnings. Not so much Alfred Munnings' horse paintings, but Alfred Munnings' rector verso paintings, which he made rather unintentionally. Alfred Munnings um, sketched in nature, en plein air, and he took pieces of wooden boards, I think they're all wooden, no cardboard, made an old sketch and then sometimes um, turned the board to use a reverse side just for economical, practical reasons. But I thought how, what, a, what a strange thing that is to have a painting that actually has um, a, a landscape image on, on either side. And what a strange position this uh, double painting gives us as viewers squeezed into an impossible half centimeter of board. I don't even think that they are all rectors of views of one in the same place, but I couldn't help seeing them as that, as painted from one position. And some more snapshots. Snapshots of um, the tidal zone. The tidal zone, the mud flats of the estuary of the River Thames, which were a new, new topography, a new type of landscape to me, since I um, grew up in southern Germany and now live in Berlin. I hardly ever have a few like that. I hardly ever see the horizon on all sides around me. And I found that I greatly enjoy um, my view being drawn towards the horizon. And I think it's being constantly confronted with um, the vast mud flats and the vastness of, um, of the land. That um, led to another work that I'm going to show next week. Well, as you see, it's a glass plate covered with paint, and I'm um, wiping the paint away with my hands until something like a landscape appears.
what you just saw was um, will not be visible um, next week. It's a video independently of uh, my exhibition at Focal Point. It's just um, as close as I get um, to explain the process, which might be a bit complex if I only talk about it or only show you those photographs. I will cover the um, entire, not the entire, but the right side of the glass facade of Focal Point Gallery with black paint, wipe it free, wipe it free partially, and then um, print the patterns on the window screens onto um, light sensitive um, silver gelatin paper so that um, all parts that are blackened will leave white marks on the photographic paper because they will block the light and all parts that um, will be clear will um, leave black marks because they will allow light to transgress um, the surface. And this is uh, the last image. I look forward to, hope to see you next Saturday. <laughs>
White bears rang along its edges. The ship came so close to it that its main yard brushed against a snag and shattered some delicate icicles. We saw some in which were embedded huge stones torn from the natural glacier and which therefore carried over the waves fragments of alien rock. We saw others which had imprisoned whales when drawn together by some mysterious force. Above the level of the ocean, they seemed to be swimming in the air. Leaning over the bridge, we watched some moving icebergs. Leaning over the bridge, we watched the moving icebergs. Evening fell. At sunset, the mountains were opalescent. New ones appeared. They trailed laminated algae, which, long and fine as hair, appeared first as captive sirens, then as a vast reticulation. The moon shone through as jellyfish in a net as Necratius Holothurian. Then, moving freely through the open sky, the moon turned, azure-coloured. Pensive, pensive stars went astray, whirled, plunged into the sea. Toward midnight appeared a gigantic vessel. The moon illuminated it mysteriously. Its rigging stood motionless. The bridge was dark. It passed close beside us. There was no sound of oars, no noise from the crew. We finally realised that it ought to be the ice, between two icebergs that had closed in on it. It passed on by, silently, and disappeared. Toward morning, a little while before dawn, a cool breeze brought alongside us an islet of purest ice. In the middle, like globed fruit, like a magic egg, gleamed an immortal jewel. It was a morning star on the waves, and we could not tire of gazing at it. It was as pure as a ray from Lyra. It vibrated at dawn like a melody, but as soon as the sun rose, the ice that had encased it melted and allowed it to fall into the sea. That day we fished for whales. This marks the end of my memories and the beginning of my undated journal. It was the evening of the last day. The sun that marked the season's end had disappeared on the horizon. A crepuscular glow remained long after its disappearance. The sunset was without agony, without purple on the clouds. The sun had disappeared slowly. Its refracted rays still reached us, but it was already beginning to become very cold. The sea around us had frozen once more, imprisoning the ship. The ice thickened by the hour and constantly threatened to crush the ship. It offered us only the flimsiest protection, and we resolved to leave it. But I want to state clearly that our decision resulted neither from despair nor from the tismus. But I want to state clearly that our decision resulted neither from despair nor from timorous prudence, but rather from a manical urge, for we could still break the ice, flee from the winter, and follow the course of the sun. But that would have taken us backward, and so. Preferring the harshest shores, provided that they were new, we moved towards the night. Our day never... And so, preferring the harshest shores, provided that they were new. And so, preferring the harshest shores, provided that they were new, we moved toward the night, our day having come to an end. We knew that happiness is not simply escape from sadness. We were going proud and strong beyond the worst sorrows to the purest joy. From parts of the ship we had fashioned a sled. After hitching the big reindeer to the sled, we began to load it with wood, axes and rope. That evening, as a sign of morning and farewell, we burned the ship. Night was approaching majestically, moving in slowly. The flames leapt up triumphantly, the sea was aflame. The great masts and beams burned, and then, the vessel having been consumed, the purple flames sank once more, leaving the irreparable past. We set out for the Polar Sea. Journey toward the Pole. The excessive whiteness of things produced a strange glow. They are bathed in radiance. The wind blows furiously, and the snow, lifted up and driven by the wind, scatters piles up, whirls, undulates, furls as cloth or human hair. One obstacle after another along the route made our journey very slow. We had to cut our way through the ice, chiseling stairs as we advanced. I do not wish to speak of our labours. They were so painful, so hard, that I would, not, that I would seem to be... 
I do not wish to speak of our labours. They were so painful, so hard, that I would seem to be complaining if I merely counted them. Nor do I wish to speak of either the cold or, or our suffering. It would be ridiculous to say we suffered terribly, for our suffering was immeasurably greater than anything these words might suggest. I would never succeed in conveying through words the supreme bitterness of our suffering. I would never be able to explain how the very acridity I would never be able to explain how the very acridity of our suffering gave birth to something resembling joy, pride, nor the rabid bite of the cold. Far to the north towered a strange rampart of ice. An enormous and prismatic block stood there like a wall. Leading up to it was a deep ravine, into which spilled a whirling mass of snow, driven perhaps by an unwavering wind. Without the ropes that linked us to each other, we would have been buried in the snow. Soon we were so tired of walking through the storm that, in spite of the danger of lying down on the snow, we stretched out to sleep. We took shelter behind a big block of ice. The wind blew the snow overhead. The wall formed a grotto. We were lying on the bed of the sled and on the skin of the slaughtered reindeer. While the other six were sleeping, I went out alone from the grotto to see if it had stopped snowing. Through the shroud of snow, I thought I saw Ellis pensive near a white rock. She seemed not to see me. She was looking toward the pole. Her hair was loose and the wind was blowing it across her face. I dared not speak to her because she seemed so sad and I doubted that it was she. And as I was unable to be sad and to finish the voyage at that same time, I left her and went back to sleep. The snow is now flying over our heads because of the very violence of the wind. We are at the foot of a great wall. A strange passageway leans there. A strange passageway leans there. The wall, as smooth as a mirror and as transparent as crystal, is depressed at the end of the passageway. One spot where no snow has fallen. One spot where no snow has fallen is also transparent. Bending under the weight of our presentiments, we read these two words written on the wall as if by a diamond on glass and reminiscent of a voice from the grave. H.I.C. Desperatives. And then a blurred date. And under these words we saw, after we had fallen on our knees in a common gesture, we saw a corpse lying inside the transparent ice, settling all around him. The ice had entombed him and the intense cold inside his sepulchre had prevented decomposition. His features betrayed frightful fatigue. His features betrayed frightful fatigue. He held a paper in his hand. We felt that we had come almost to an end of our voyage. We still felt strong enough, however, to climb down the frozen wall, suspecting all the while that our goal lay beyond, but not knowing for sure. And now, that we had done everything possible to reach it, we found it almost futile to persevere. Before this unknown tomb, we remained still on our knees, impassive, unreflective, for we had reached the point where compassion turns to self-pity and where sadness must be ignored if its strength if it's to be conserved. The heart is emboldened only through induration. And for these reasons, rather than avoiding violating the sepulchre, we did not break through the ice despite our desire to read what was written on the paper held by the corpse. After a short prayer, we stood up and began painfully to climb up the wall of ice. I am not sure how the wind that crossed the storm arose, for as soon as we had crossed over the wall, it ceased and the atmosphere became almost mild. The other side of the wall was a gentle declivity formed by soft snow. Then there was a row of vegetation. Then a small unfrozen lake. I think that the surrounding wall was perfectly circular for the slopes tapered regularly. And since the wind no longer blew inside this enclosed area, the water in the lake remained calm. We were sure that this was the end. We could no longer advance, but knowing that we would not know what to do there if we went down to the shore, in order to contrive some sort of conclusion, or some culminating gesture, we had the pious notion of going back to get the unknown corpse and burying it behind the lake. For we thought that this traveller too, 
Another person had also travelled far to see the lake, and we were sorry that he had been unable to reach his goal. We went back to his tomb, broke through the ice, and removed his body. When we tried to read the paper which he was holding, however, we saw that it was completely blank. Our disappointment was all the more painful because our curiosity had been dissipated. We carried his body to the little Polish shore without ever putting into words our feeling that it was perhaps better for him never to have seen the anticipated shore and for the wall to have separated him from his goal during his lifetime. For even if the facts had been different, the words chiselled on his tomb would probably have been the same. A cheerless dawn was breaking as we made one last attempt to blot our misgivings by digging a grave in the grass between the snow and the water in the lake. We no longer wished to return to the regions where flowers bloomed more profusely, to the monotonous past, for one does not travel backward and downward to find life. If we had known from the outset that this was what we had come to see, perhaps we would not have started. That is why we gave thanks to God for having hidden us from the goal and for having withheld it from us until our efforts to attain it had afforded us some pleasure. The only certain pleasure if we had not known at the outset that this was what we had come to see, perhaps we would not have started. That is why we gave thanks to God for having hidden us from the goal and for having us withheld it from us until our efforts to attain it had afforded us some pleasure, the only certain pleasure. And we also thank God because our intense suffering had made us hope for a splendid end. We would have liked indeed to devise anew some tenuous and more pious hope, having satisfied our pride and feeling that the fulfilment of our destinies no longer depended on us, we now waited for the things around us to become a little more faithful to us. Kneeling still, we probed the black water for the reflection of the heaven of my dreams. Seamus Heaney, Death of a Naturalist. All year the flax dam festered in the heart of the townland. Green and heavy-headed, flax had rotted there, weighted down by huge sods. Daily, it sweltered in the punishing sun. Bubbles gargled delicately. Blue bottles wove a strong gauze of sound around the smell. There were dragonflies, spotted butterflies, but best of all, was the warm, thick slobber of frogspawn that grew like clotted water in the shade of the banks. Here, every spring, I would fill a jam potfuls of the jellied specks to range on window stills at home, on shelves at school, and wait and watch until the fattening dusts burst into tadpoles. Here, every spring, I would fill jam potfuls of the jellied specks to range on window sills at home, on shelves at school, and wait and watch until the fattening dots burst into nimble, swimming tadpoles. Miss Waltz would tell us how the daddy frog was called a bullfrog, and how he croaked, and how the mummy frog laid hundreds of little legs, and this was frog spawn. You could tell the weather by the frogs too, for they were yellow in sun and brown in rain. Then one day, when fields were rank with cow dung in the grass, the angry frogs invaded the flank down. Then one day, when fields were rank with cow dung in the grass, the angry frogs invaded the flax dam. I ducked through the hedges to a coarse croaking that I had not heard before. The air was thick with a bass chorus. Right down the dam, gross-bellied frogs were cocked on sods. Their loose necks pulsed like sails. Some hopped. The slap and plop were obscene threats. Some sat poised like mud grenades, their blunt heads farting. I sickened, turned, and ran. The great slime kings were gathered there for vengeance, and I knew that if I dipped my hand in the spawn, it would clutch it. I'm going to speak um, very briefly about transubstantiation and its relation to our marsh landscape, channeled through my own practice and also Alexandra's findings thereof, of the landscape. Um, in an ageing black and white photo of an ancient Egyptian false door, something is gradually being revealed through the film of the print, 
a crepuscular mark in the page, a white noise in the production process, a glitch in the paper. The false door was a common architectural element in ancient Egyptian tombs, a portal for the dead to the underworld. So why is a false door apposite to exit into hidden fields in an imaginary of the mudflats? This is not just a field of reeds, also a term for the verdant Egyptian afterlife, but a field of readings, garbled messages picked up in the air, spiralled in the marsh, a transubstantiation, which describes a sacred or profane conversion of substances in the Eucharistic sense of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, but also in the act of inscription and invocation can this be found, a rupture of the psycho-archaeological, an effective place where you tune into an ancient frequency. This is an important act of cutting that eschews our current flat field of equivocal automation, a divination of the potentials of or the actualization of our present state, an urgent funneling of marsh water under the surface of polarization. This fluidity is possibly female, a flowing that is important to self-emergence. This change of substance rips exterior into interior, making the matter a shimmering and intense energy, reflecting the sparkle of the dark outside. As with the photograph, crop marks and effect bleed through the surface, becoming, as Maya Deren writes, a white darkness. It's a perfumed murmur subtly affecting the atmosphere, where perfume comes from the Latin words perfumus, meaning through smoke, as perfume has its dark origins in ritual libation. A hole is being burnt into the present in this transubstantiation of material, a live cut-up of fragments, and something is appearing, as august as a storm, yet as subtle as a curl of smoke. And this smoke is likewise a material, no less substan insubstantial than the mud. As Blanchot describes, it is about the invisibility of the visible. In transubstantiation, in the ghost of the earth, in the development of the paper, there is an appearance and a disappearance, an opening of different planes at the index point of the totem pole. As the Jacobean physician and scholar Sir Thomas Brown wrote, a large part of the earth is still in the urn unto us. These contingent gestures, inscriptions through ritual invocation, folding, are evidenced as scorch marks and crop marks in black and parched grass, ghostly materialisations, a flickering movement of quantum effect, a ghost cell flowing in recognition to false fields and strange attractor patterns brought about by technology. Hidden markings appear in the estuary, reinscribing the possibilities of the present, making the marsh a vibratory membrane. This is a threshold house to another space, as effective as ancient cave drawings, amplifying the vibration's aleatory power. Breath and air draw attention to this rich material process, acknowledging the fluid coexistence of these vibrations and resonances, as Luce Irigari describes in her philosophy of breath. Essex clay makes a porous surface with this gesture of inscription, as ancient cuneiform text would have been inscribed on clay tablets brought from the mud, so asynchronous temporalities are grasped in a spatial image, exposing the slippage between matter, sight and temporality, as well as in so-called coincidences, in moments glimpsed of conscious otherness. Marsh glyphs on mud, blown up as grainy photocopies, are attendant on binary flickers of light on the photocopy as black glass, replicating the alchemist's scrying mirror. This is an alchemy of feeling, a transmission more than an image. In the dark waters of the marsh, the feeling slips, turbulent and fractal, lunar as the female cycle, a chaotic formulation key to this threshold space of transubstantiation. The living can assi insist the imagination of the dead. The revelation of inscription into clay and the air into brain tissue performs a suspension, a dramaturgy of unknowing, a radio mystery play. Inscription can be a methodology, the very nadir of signification, the remedial cinder burnt through the possibility of representation in the images of four stores and crop circles. Here, images are more indexed than icon, but they might also be simulacra, echoes of the past, like the demons the ancient hermeticists invoked into holy images. Um, okay, I'm, I'm also going to read a short text, but I'm just going to give a quick context. Um, I've known Alexandra's work for a long time. Um, I'm also an artist and I've been a fan of her work for a long time and so I was um, really excited to see her talk and also to, um, I kept thinking a lot also about, and uh, maybe I thought it would be interesting to just notate that a lot of your older work was about gardens. Um, you did a lot of research into gardens and also you had a lot of work um, which was about mirroring so I sort of started thinking a lot about that in your talk. Um, and the one thing um, 
in advance of this, um, Alexandra showed uh, me the video that uh, she made of these beautiful um, um, pushing away of paint. Um, and what is the name of the um, photographic process that you're using? I, um, well, the photographic process I'm using is basically a photogram or a contact print, but um, I gave the video the title Cliché Vert, yeah. because it goes back to um, well, 19th century technique um, to reproduce landscape drawings. That is, um, it was mostly used by landscape painters, but it's got nothing to do with landscape in itself. It's just um, an early mixture of photography and other printing techniques where you blacken um, a glass screen with soot and then um, make an etching into it or just use a pencil and um, write into it and you therefore um, yeah, you, um, sort of cut holes into the soot surface and then you can print it, can make a contact print which will then give you um, a black line on a white sheet of photographic paper. And then I guess, which is like inscribing into a surface, um, which is similar to the quote marks you're looking at. And I, but also in the, your video, what I thought was really interesting was that you were doing this very kind of like liquid uh, movement. Um, and just briefly to contextualize what I'm going to read, um, um, recently in my own work I've been doing something whereby um, it was really nice to see yours because I've been pouring paint on surfaces and then using mops and brooms to kind of move it around and then exposing that to light. So I've also been thinking a lot about what is this thing that light does to a gesture. And in my work in general, I'm a painter, I'm really thinking about gesture. So um, this is a piece of writing that's coming from like an ongoing, uh, a kind of much, much longer, it'll be a book at some point. Um, thing on gesture, but I thought I would focus um, my questions around gesture and liquidity, and I thought then that really hopefully overlaps um, um, as well with everybody's interest. So um, it's just a couple minutes, and then I'll, I have a couple questions for Alexandra. So um, in the essay, Notes on Gesture, the theorist Giorgio Agamben tells us that, quote, cinema leads images back to the homeland of gesture, end quote. What is a gesture? asks the Gambin. It is something which is inscribed into the sphere of action, but is neither acting or making. It is neither production or performance, not the mark or the act that makes the mark. So in reading a Gambin, I began to understand gesture as the flickering of firelight animating a cave painting of jumping animals, or the stills of film juddering together to make movement. I am understanding gesture as the imaginative jump in our heads which believes in the action that created the physical trace of the event. Quote from Agamben again, it is as if a silent invocation calling for the liberation of images into gesture arose from the entire history of art. This is what in ancient Greece was expressed by the legends in which statues break the ties holding them and begin to move. End quote. And what if we imagine this movement as a liquid form, this move from A to B? Some notes on liquids. Liquids are abstract unforms, rushing to fill space, existing not specifically here or there, but homogeneously across any expanse. They spread out, slide down, drip, seep, feel wet. They push uncontrollably outwards, are messy and immeasurable. Liquids are material that behaves. They can be measured through their speed, conductibility, and viscosity as much as by volume. Their meaning is to move. What is this flow? Quote, it is already getting around. At what rate, in what context, in spite of what resistances? End quote. That's from Irrigary in her, uh, Luce Irrigary, um, in her chapter, The Mechanics of Fluids, in the book, The Sex That Is Not One. Um, Irrigary outlines the idea of the female as a liquid in that, quote, women diffuse themselves according to modalities scarcely compatible with the framework of the ruling symbolics, end quote. I would say that the gesture is liquid. It is a liquid, both adjective and noun. Lately, I've been thinking that a painting happens all over the place. And what if a canvas is just in the way? Um, so, I had um, 
sorry, I'm from notes on my iPhone. Um, I thought it was really interesting when you showed the crop marks and this sense of photography as something that's like uncovering uh, a crime or a history or, you know, there's this kind of um, really great narrative in photography that it reveals something. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you might um, be interested in talking about like the reveal uh, in, in some way in, in your work or in this, in this project? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, um, I, I was really um, fascinated by those crop marks um, because of my um, love for photography and because um, I felt that um, what's happening on those meadows and fields is um, really closely related um, to what's happening in the dark room. If you see an image appear um, in the developer bath, and you have you you have an unspecific surface, a white sheet of or exposed um, but not developed paper in case of photography, and you wait and see, and time brings something to the surface that um, would, without that process, without developer or without the growth of plants, never be visible. And I was also thinking that the plants themselves are actually the medium. Um, because they are what make um, those traces um, visible. So they give them a substance, um, give, some, give a substance to something that would otherwise um, be just hidden underneath um, the surface and <coughs> invisible for, for anybody. But that's really um, kind of perspective that uh, biologically we're not really meant to be granted, isn't it? That kind of aerial perspective. So you're kind of conflating almost kind of be your, your experience of being on the ground with that kind of admittedly kind of quite male perspective of a kind of a military image. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like they're the, kind of the sort of parallax of those kind of combining. Mm. And uh, we spoke before, um, the, the kind of amazingness of cartography from kind of the medieval period where there was no aerial image, but they still managed to navigate and create something quite plausible yeah. as a kind of outline of the land. But, um, I think you've kind of looked at those kind of different perspectives of kind of aerial and sort of sort of a worm's eye view before, haven't you? Kind the of worm's eye view, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> but that, that kind of um, are, they, are they kind of uh, colliding for you in the, in the kind of films that you showed? Kind of because you, you kind of meant you used the recording of your feet whilst kind of being very yes. kind of hundreds of miles, not maybe hundreds of miles, but definitely. Miles that, above. That's what I meant when I said that I wanted to give um, a body to um, the few. Mm -hmm. And, well, if I have to divide between male and female perspective, I'd say that in the male perspective is a disembodied eye um, hovering in the sky, whereas the female perspective is one involved in the material. Um, but that's not, um, that's not exclusive for either men or women. I think that Baker tells us a lot of that um, sensation to, to sink in, to become one with the material, and, and he's a and male writer. And also to writer. become one with the bird, because he kind yeah. of became a bird as well, didn't he? Became he became a bird kind of like well. took on kind of like bird-like talon, sort of, he felt himself kind of changing into kind of avian form, I think, yeah. from understanding what he wrote. That's also why I liked um, the image of the um, two wells sunken into the meadow mm -hmm. so much, because I kind of imagined Baker's eyes and those um, lines drawn into the sky as um, him viewing the birds, no, I mean like like in ancient times when people thought that seeing was actually something active, that you're not passively receiving images, but you're um, almost grabbing um, what you look at, as if your eyes would be invisible touch hands them. that can touch something. I yeah. like that idea a lot, that yeah. um, your eyes are not a recording machine, but actually reach out into the world. Mm -hmm. And the light come out, coming out of the eyes is kind of often drawn like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, which also relates, I think to this interest in photography. I, like there's this magical quality in photography which comes from this idea of like the light being captured or capturing the soul of the person or capturing mm -hmm. hidden, um, you know, yeah, spirits. Yeah. Um, and also um, capturing, I think, is, um, is the term here. And also in the beginning we heard Baker describe um, his own experiences with the peregrines. He, uh, he, he draws that analogy between hunting and uh, be becoming the hunter, becoming the prey, um, or in a way um, thinking like an animal. 
I've, I've found it strange that he uses the word hunter because all throughout the book I had the feeling that he's not a hunter at all, um, which I find really beautiful um, about his book. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't capture, he doesn't shoot, he just observes mm. and, um, and he doesn't even take, I mean, that's also why I included those postcards in, the, in, in, my, in my talk because I found it striking that he doesn't take a single photograph. Mm. He's been observing birds all throughout his life, but he, he never pictured them, so mm. he never tried to get a hold of them. He mm. always let them free, he let them be in the sky in a mm. way. And also very evasive about the actual locations of things. Like he never actually named any places, I don't think, in his book. Yeah. So it, it's kind of down to you as the kind of, you know, investigator to kind of locate where you think these places were, um, you know, kind of from the descriptions he gives. That's it's why kind of I was like a so respect or a secrecy towards the bird's uh, sort of uh, life or kind of plane of existence to not kind of really reveal it that much. Yeah. yeah, that's a ni um, nice way of um, seeing it. I was always thinking that Baker doesn't um, give us time or place because he wants to say something more universal. It's very Essex specific because he spent all his life in Essex, but at the same time, um, it's not even necessarily a peregrine that he's observing. I, I think there's a level where it's beyond the specific, the specific bird or landscape or mm. um, time period. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you put it like that, I probably should not have marked out that tower. Or maybe it helps that it doesn't exist. But it, anymore. it allows a kind of private investigation to happen, which is kind of what we were talking about with material evidence yeah. and kind of, you know, the kind of Sisyphean maybe the thing of kind of trying to kind of account for. Um, well, certainly in a kind of old-fashioned taxonomy way, the kind of impossibility of making a taxonomy of everything, so just don't bother. <laughs> but kind of then kind of sort of uh, making a kind of a comment on that by kind of showing these gestures that are maybe more kind of slight or material or fluid mm. that aren't kind of really actually about control mm -hmm. in the same way but it's kind of referencing that kind of attempt to sort of taxonomy something. Um, yeah. Um, I was interested when you were talking also I, I kept coming back to this question in my head of like what is the relationship for you between this research into landscape and then this move into kind of actually something quite gestural um, you know, and I kept thinking, what is the connection? Was it? And I, it, and I, I want to ask you that question, but I also want to, like, I kept thinking about, um, and I don't have the quote in front of me, unfortunately, but there's a nice quote from uh, Evelyn Bois' book. Um, oh, actually, I can't remember what the title is. One of his books on painting, in which he talks about the idea that, like, um, Evelyn, Evelyn Bois. Evelyn Bois. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is a. Bryce had revisited. I'm sorry? Bright Side Revisited? No, it's a book, um, oh geez, I'm sorry, I can't remember which oh, book it is right now. Yeah, but it's, um, it's, it's a book, Formless, A User's Guide, sorry, by, with him and Rosalind Krauss uh, wrote it in, I think, the 80s. And it, there's this one passage where he describes how, um, even though we don't think about painting as a kind of window into, onto the world anymore, there's this idea that um, in painting and art and photography, the viewer is um, kind of does not have their feet in the dirt. And, mm -hmm. and then I really like this idea that he's starting to think about, um, in modernism, a lot of times, painters, especially like Pollock or whatever, a lot of these guys were really interested actually in talking about animal spirits and there was thinking about the painting as a landscape on which like action was happening. So in a way I started to think about your trip in a way <laughs> almost as like the gesture or, or was starting to think like is, is that interesting for you to think like if the following of this landscape in itself was a gesture? Yeah, I don't know, a gesture. Where does then the kind of gesture Well it felt like more than a gesture. I got yeah. really bad. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You <laughs> got burnt. Yeah. But I, um, that's, that's a couple of questions in... Yeah, sorry, a lot. Um, in one, one concerns um, the idea of um, image space as a flatbed or as um, or a confined space on hanging vertically on the wall. And that's a question that I kept coming back to. You mentioned Rosalind Cross, so you maybe know her article on originality, mm -hmm. where she talks about um, the turn into the horizontal. And that I, f I find a very interesting idea that for centuries we've been um, looking at paintings vertically and we always knew where our position is because it's uh, the 
the vantage point is um, opposite the vanishing point. So there's a clear relationship between the horizon line and us as viewers. And um, it is true that we as viewers are not represented in the painting through the construction through the construction of perspective, we are sort of excluded from the image, we are invisible observers, which again, I think is a very male position, one of control, an invisible eye, is a far more dangerous eye than um, an embodied eye. If you think of surveillance cameras, for example, that's sort of the um, epicenter of um, disembodied eyes. Um, and it's so connected to control. Um, still, we ha have a direct li relationship to the image space. Whereas, um, as soon as we are leaving the vertical and are going into the horizontal, and um, Rosalind Krauss talks about grids and maps as well, and how for her there are no abstract paintings because uh, um, there's always the representation of the grid, which mm. I find an, an interesting idea. We are all of a sudden uh, positionless. That's, I guess, why there are so many, um, well, also my fascination with um, Simon Faithful's film and with Audion Redon's um, eye in the, in, in the sky. So um, where are we if we look down on a map or where are we if we use Google Maps? Um, we don't have a point of view anymore and I think I felt the need to um, get back the point of view and that's why I started yeah. on the, um, in that case I think rather textual, um, mm. I wouldn't call them landscape paintings but um, mm. preparations for photograms mm. maybe and I'm um, I also enjoyed the contradiction of inscribing a gesture into a surface and the photographic <coughs> process. You say maybe the painting is uh, happening everywhere at the same time? I misquote. Could be at the same I, I, time. I, I misquote yeah. you yeah, all, yeah. but you said... Everywhere. <laughs> I guess I also talked about it as I'm thinking happens like... Happens all over the place. Like a gesture happens and then like the painting or whatever it is just comes along for the ride sometimes. Yeah. Uh, which, um, yeah, but I also, yeah, I think that idea of point of POV, the P, the point of view, I was thinking, um, I think it's really interesting that your point of view is dealing with this idea, I mean, this kind of very, yeah, historic idea of, like, the author leaves a trace, <laughs> the gesture is the trace of the action of the author, but then what's so nice in the video is that you see yourself, um, mm. behind it. I really like that kind of... Um, the, the flip of the painting. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I'm sort of, I'm sort of uh, encaged, yeah, yeah. locked up on yeah. the other side of the painting. And it makes me think of... Um, I, I work often with a writer, her name is Eva Kenny, and we, I invited her to write an essay because um, she was uh, talking about an unfinished thing that she wrote, which is basically the one of the first ever, or basically what's considered the first <coughs> abstract painting, is by um, a man named Franzik Kupka, um, and he painted a, a kind of portrait of his wife in 1910, um, and kind of left it there, and then a year later, um, kind of, it was a, not a very good portrait, it's kind of like face in the center, and then he kind of turned it around, and he turned it back around, and a year later he just painted a bunch of marks on top of her. <laughs> um, and so she talks about this idea that this painting, which is kind of the first modernist painting, in, I mean, there's a lot of debate around that, but um, is kind of literally a dissolving of a female figure into abstraction, or this idea, she talks about it as like a painting behind it, or like a woman behind the painting. Um, and that this idea that like uh, the the kind of subject of women, like the w woman as a kind of subject on which painting, the view is, the POV is of women, and then in modernism it starts to be kind of, they dissolve, and in a way then women start kind of making work, and then where do they come out again, you know, where is their point of view, <laughs> in a way, is something I'm really interested in. So I think in that video I thought it's really quite, I don't know, a nice, uh, or really kind of clear, almost like revealing of this um, 
point of view of the female author in a way, which I think is, yeah, I don't know, interesting that you show yourself also in the, when you flipped the painting and you see just a flash of your <coughs> face behind the painting. I thought that was really interesting. Did a, a museum assistant film that for you? No, in I, the archive? I just put the camera on a tripod. Oh, okay, but it, oh, so that was in the Munnings Museum, was it? No, that was in the uh, Focal Point Gallery, oh, okay. but we loaned the mm -hmm. Munnings um, paintings and I just played around with them. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, to briefly come back to that um, contradiction of um, painting, gesture and photography or um, um, yeah, c countering one with the other, that is an important aspect. Maybe it's mocking um, the male tradition of painting, which is which is always not always, but um, mentioned Pollock being very gestural, um, the grand gesture. I never thought of painting happening all over the place. I always thought that painting is something that um, is. It, it, I, I can only imagine painting um, as something evolving in time. Um, whereas photography, for me, is happening all over the place. Yes. If you if you expose um, or develop a photographic image, there is no linearity. It doesn't um, it appears um, at all um, different? All the different dots on the surface at the same time mm. out of the liquid. Mm. But I, sp I suppose yeah. also gesture though, it depends what gesture is, because uh, Irigari says that the first gesture of autonomy is breath, so breath is actually gesture as well. Um, and that kind of goes a bit towards what we were s sort of thinking about material, what is material and what's immaterial. So if the breath is gesture, then that's kind of material as well. So it's kind of not, it's not necessarily just what's sort of supposedly invisible, which is kind of what Baker was saying, is that what you nearly see, mm -hmm. sort of, the, but what you nearly see is still material, even if it's kind of fading into the invisible, it's still material. So for me, very much, it, everything is still very much um, a sort of a, a weird material, <laughs> mm -hmm. rather than kind of a ghostly nothing, which is almost a way of kind of disavowing it, like a sort of quite a strident duality, is actually kind of disavowing any, a lot of things, whereas if, if everything is material, then it's kind of a kind of interpenetration. Of lots of different materials going on, and so that in that way, kind of, it's almost impossible to account for all these gestures because if breath is the, the first gesture, it's kind of a distancing from your mother, but also a communion with everyone else that's also breathing. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that that kind of gesture to me is so huge that you can't even see it. <laughs> it's like you, you really would need to actually to go up to sort of above the earth to see see it because it's so big. It's happening all the time, mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that's how I kind of related to the, your kind of the painting happening everywhere. That you're almost just kind of capturing a bit of it in a frame, yeah. maybe, yeah, rather, rather, than, rather than putting it in the frame. Yeah. It's there when you're sort of doing that. <laughs> yeah, or rather than I think even it's quite a, you speaking made me think like rather than thinking that there's a taxonomy of gestures and actually there isn't. Mm -hmm. It's much more fluid and, mm -hmm. and material, um, immaterial too, mm -hmm. than that, um, which is maybe kind of interesting also in thinking about landscape. Um, Would you say that um, if there is a trace, um, it, ha has, it has not been a gesture but rather an act? So that the gesture stops where the mark starts? Um, Mm, I would say gesture is, is kind of tracing as well. Um, I don't know what you think. <laughs> I've been I've been personally getting very interested in yeah just that there's a uh, distinct actually distance between gesture and uh, uh, this idea that like um, an author makes a trace and then that's the gesture, but rather actually thinking like at least in reading this Agamben piece, he oftentimes speaks about the idea is that gesture is something that's endured. Um, um, and he often and he talks about the idea that cinema has released um, or helped us find again the idea of gesture. So I, I'm really like I'm really interested. I talk a lot sometimes also about like Amy Silman's paintings, and she talks about making things so that you see the movement between the paintings or the decisions. And I find this to be really interesting that like the gesture is not actually happening in the painting, but it's happening in the understanding between things, like why did you, like in the understanding of why you've made these works, mm -hmm. is how, like I don't just see a black and white image, I understand, when I understand how you've made it, then it becomes a thing with liveliness. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? And that liveliness of the author is not just simply the liveliness that's the mark, but rather the understanding, I don't know, the, the like imagination of you doing it, you know, mm -hmm. becomes, this ghostly, almost like 
reenactment that happens over, it can happen a million times in my head, you know, or just once, you know, so it's not a performance, literally, yeah. but it's an imagine. it can be imagined endlessly, you know, which is kind of the potential of it, I think. Would that, Sophie, would that maybe be, um, is there a connection to your idea of transubstantiation, that um, there's, Initially, there's a gesture, and then something is becoming alive. Something that maybe mm. has been dead before, or has been flat before. That it's um, that there's a sort of a charging of um, something. I suppose um, the kind of the original kind of trace idea is that there's something already always deferred or traced. So the, I wouldn't like to think of something suddenly coming alive, sort of zombie-like, because I think things are kind of almost coexisting. So that I, but I used to, even though even though I've just said that, I still kind of like the idea of a kind of rift of something kind of sort of bleeding through the material that you can't explain. But that inexplicability is still part of the nature of matter. I don't think it's like a sort of necessarily like supernatural thing because I think the, the strangest thing is matter on a kind of quantum level, mm -hmm. like the kind of non-locality of things and kind of, um, you know, the, the kind of spooky action at a distance, I think Einstein called it, kind of like matter is kind of um, uh, strange connections are happening by default and so that's, that's really kind of maybe what's kind of the transubstantiation is kind of an acknowledgement of that mm -hmm. rather than as anything truly kind of ghostly. Because so there is no dead matter, matter is always mm, alive already, yeah, so yeah, no need yeah. to... Um so yeah, yeah the, sort of if the, so the, the ancient text that comes up through the marsh or whatever yeah. is kind of um, it's not something kind of ghastly that's coming back because it's kind of always almost been there I suppose it's kind of the, the material kind of conflagration of things.